Sal Berry. What will we make fun of now that grandeur is sold out? And Tim Parrish. People are so sensitive. I'm not going to listen to your podcast. You don't know anything about hockey. This is the Puck Junk Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. I'm Sal Berry and with me is Tim Parrish. And today we're going to talk about the SP Signature Edition Legends Hockey Card Set. We'll also talk about the new Upper Deck Evolution Digital Trading Cards or whatever the heck they call them. Don't call them NFTs. Don't call them cards. They got another name for them. And a few other odds and ends. Tim, what's going on, man? You know, just uh, out here trying to live my best cardboard life, you know. Your best cardboard life, yeah. I heard you my got best. to putter around in your card room re- recently. Um, Make a day of it or a half day of it. I tried to, but, you know, you get so distracted with things. You, you see, oh, I need to put this away or I need to move this or I need to do that. And then you just fall down a rabbit hole and start looking through boxes and So I really didn't accomplish anything by it. Yeah, it's like you try to put away, you know, the 25 cards or whatever that are cluttering your desk. And then you have to figure out where some of them go. And then you go, oh, wait, but then I got to put this. But this goes with this. And I got to put these in order. So then you got to put those in order. And they're like, okay, now I got to find these. And you do that. So it's like everything's like a side quest within a side quest when it comes to like organizing and sorting your cards it's like well i'd like to sort these cards but then i gotta move these other cards and then like you said you start looking through a box and then you find something else and then that distracts you yeah that's where i'm at kind of like it's basically somewhere halfway between i need a vacation and i need a therapist so somewhere in there or maybe you need both it shouldn't be either or i need vacational therapist or a therapist will see you while while you're on vacation. Or just a vacation and skip the therapist. Okay. So Upper Deck finally launched its first few evolution hockey cards on Tuesday. At least the preview of them. The preview cards, yeah. But they did launch one card of a logo for they ten dollars, like an animated logo, the evolution logo. They did. I was like Okay, this is their big announcement. It's uh, okay. And, okay, cool. Let's see these cards. And it's a logo. I'm like, wow. I was underwhelmed by that. Like, that's how they hit the ground running was with an animated logo card for $10. Well, I mean, when you watch a movie, the first thing that pops up is the 17 splash screens of all the production companies involved in making it. So, Oh, my God. Yes, it's TriStar Pictures presents Bad Robot and... A Michael Bay production, and uh, yeah, it's right. like a million things. Yeah, so this was kind of that, like, hey, look, it's it's Evo, it's Evolution, it's different color Evos. So uh, they sold out, or at least they said they sold out. Went to EPAC, didn't see them there today. They were on the Evo thing. So, so if you don't know what this is, it's a separate platform, but you can get to it through EPAC. So use your EPAC login, and you can log into the Evo system. So you don't have to create a new account or anything like that. So if you already have an EPAC account, you can get there. Same with like their comic book thing that they do. Same username, same password. It's all the same. So yeah, you can go on there and and find it. But those are gone. So I don't think you can get those anymore. And by the time this recording comes out, you should be able to get, if they don't sell out, the uh, first set of these. Well, the preview set. Yes. I don't think it's a preview set. I think this is the preview images, and Uh then you're going to get access to the set once they make the announcement, the real announcement. Right, right, Which I'm sure is coming later. You know, I'm glad that you brought up the comic book thing, the collect forever, because honestly, yeah, so I was trying to wrap my head around this because you're more active on EPAC than I am. Mm, Which isn't saying much, but yeah. Well, no, but I get it. You tend to trade a little more online than I do. On EPAC, yeah. I'm just more, I just wait for shit to go to Com C and then just pick it up there. I could trade somebody for that card, but then I feel like a lot of times, like, either I don't have anything interesting that they want or they want too much for it. And 
just sometimes it's just easier to buy the card for a dollar or two dollars or four dollars than try to work out a trade. Because, I mean, we've talked about this before and trading on EPAC is work. It's a little There's, cumbersome. You have to have a lot of tabs open. You have to be patient, et cetera. And everybody thinks their cards are worth a million dollars on there, too. Right. And then they transfer them to Com C and sell them for 47 cents. That's what it happens a lot, yes. So this Collect Forever platform, if you're hearing about this for the first time, and hopefully I'm explaining this right, it's a place to buy and sell non-card collectibles like comic books and like Funko Pop figurines. And so the idea is, is that, I guess it's kind of like Com C, but not for cards, you know, because it's for like comic books and like I said, toys and stuff like that. And then the idea is that you could trade these things with each other. So like maybe you have like a comic book variant cover and I go, oh, I really want that. Hey, I'll trade you these five Funko Pops for it or whatever, right? And then they remain in our Collect Forever account. Like we're not shipping them to each other. I guess it's like some sort of vault. It's just like EPAC. They hold your cards until you want to send it somewhere. But then you could trade. I guess you could trade in between the platforms. So you could trade something yes. that you buy on Evo for something you buy on EPAC. And you could trade something on EPAC for something on Collect Forever. That is the, my understanding, yes. Yeah, so I mean, I have an Incredible Hulk, number one, and it's graded, and maybe it's not the highest grade copy of it, but then you go, well, I got this Austin Matthews rookie card on EPAC, and it's worth $900. Maybe we could trade that comic book for that card, and I don't know what the comic book would be worth, honestly. And you can actually trade across collectibles, which is kind of an interesting thing, because I really don't like doing apples to oranges. That confuses me a little bit, unless you kind of agree on a value. But lots of people do. I mean, it's kind of like the barter system. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you this bag of barley, and you give me that box of shotgun shells. You know? Oh, so we're running a co-op now. Yeah, so it's like totally unrelated things, but you need one and I need the other, and let's make a deal, so... I mean, that's really what it boils down to. And yeah, you're right. It's, this is how it's set up. You keep your collectibles in there. Everything flows into the EPAC account. So you have all of your inventory in the EPAC account once you decide to put it in there. And then once you do that, it's fair game on whatever you want to do with it. Trade it or have it shipped to you or whatever. It's kind of depressing, though, not to have the stuff. Well, it's, not it, all of it's real either. Not all of it's physical. Some well, of the no. stuff is digital only, just like EPAC was. And I think the Evo thing, that's almost all digital. But the fact that you can take the digital card or whatever it is, what are they calling it? Digital collectible product or whatever? Authentic digital. Authentic digital collectible. Collectible, yes. yeah. So you can take that, transfer it to your EPAC account, and now essentially trade a digital thing for a physical thing. So that's different. I guess, I suppose you could have traded digital EPAC cards for physical EPAC cards, but 99% of the time people wouldn't do that. Uh, I mean, unless they were melding the cards to make parallels. Yeah, but usually they didn't trade the digital ones because digital ones are mostly the free ones you get in the free packs. Oh, you're talking about the digital only non combinable Yeah, because there's tons of digital options on EPAC. But a lot of people don't trade them unless you're trying to like get every, you know, Maple Leafs card and there's a bunch in there. Right, right. Or whatever, whatever it may be. But now you'll be able to trade these. What is it again? Authentic digital collectibles. digital collectibles. Sorry, I keep wanting to say NFT, but I know that they're shying away from that term. Yeah, so you can trade that a digital thing for a physical thing. So. I think that's interesting. What I meant about depressing is that if I collect Funko Pop figures, I'll just go back to that example because I saw they were selling those on Collect Forever. So um, yeah, I know they have those. And I guess if I'm collecting those things, I like having them. So, I mean, it's but called you can. Collect you can buy it and ship it to you. Yeah, so you I know. that but, ability. Yeah, I know. But it's, it's kind of like, hey, I have this really rare comic book. 
but I'm going to put it in this vault and never look at it, never have it, never play with it or read it or whatever. Well, there's that part of it. Because the other thing is, I think it's only in a soft sleeve, but they encapsulate these. So I think it's only in a soft holder, maybe. I'm mm-hmm. not sure if it's like a full-on like graded case for the comics. but And I really don't know how all that works. I don't know if it's a digital copy of the comic or if it's the actual comic. I'm not a comic book person, so I haven't got into that part of it. The last comic book I bought was at an anime convention about seven years ago. If I'm remembering correctly, and it was some guy who was sitting at a table and he was selling his own comic and he said, hey, would you buy a copy of my comic book? And I said, I'd love to. And I handed him the five dollar bill and I took his comic because it takes creativity and time and effort to create something. And then it takes guts to put yourself out there. I bought the comic from him, but I never read it. And I feel bad, and every now and then I'll I'll find the copy of it floating around, and I'm like, oh yeah, I I should, I should probably read that sometimes and get my five dollars worth. But last comic book I ever obtained was the uh, free copy of Crypto the Super Dog at the movie theater that you could just take when you buy your ticket. Best because no, I'm saying that's the last one I got. Oh, the and last it, one. And it was only because it was free they were giving them out at the movie theater. Mm-hmm. And I believe it's still in my car to this day. <laughs> wow. It fell under the seat. The kids stepped on it. And who knows? That tells you how big of a priority comic books are to me. My stepson likes comics. He's a huge Punisher fan. So he has tons of Punisher comics. Huh. You know, okay. Hey, well, I'll just mention this just because we're, we're on this topic, even though we're not a comic book podcast. Although our fellow Puck Junk. It could be whatever we want. <laughs> Our fellow puck junk guy, Jim Howard, is into comic books. So Saturday, May 6th, is free comic book day. So go to your local comic book shop and get some free comic books. Oh, we used to do that all the time. There was a place in one of the towns by me called Chemshaw. It was a half donut shop, half comic book store. Wow. It was a really cool place. It was in an old really old building like early 1900s it used to be a bank so the bank vault was still in there and they, they that's where they kept all the really high priced comic books back mm-hmm. in the in the vault so you walk through with a big circular door and everything mm-hmm. but it was a really cool shop you could get donuts and they were like the good donuts that were made there all fancy and stuff and get the comic books we would always go in there for comic book day they would make the donuts oh yeah it was a husband and wife that ran the place the wife ran the donut part she was a chef a baker so they made all sorts of like gourmet type donuts and then he ran the comic book part if i was a kid i would just go there and never leave i'd like oh, yeah. it was awesome it was i'd really buy cool like place. three donuts buy some comics sit down read the comics, eat my donuts. And when I ran out of donuts, I'd buy more donuts. And when I needed more comics, I'd buy more comics. Not that I had that kind of money when I was a kid, but that sounds like heaven, you know? <laughs> it was a really it was a really cool concept. It was a really cool store. We had a lot of fun in there. We went in there quite a bit, but they went out of business, unfortunately. I'll just throw so. out this random fact about myself, not that it's important to the show, And some of you might already know this, but my first ever job was working in a card and comic book store. Kind of set the bar really high for myself because then like the second job I had was at a t-shirt store, which was also awesome. But then after that, it's like the rest of my retail jobs pretty much sucked until I didn't do retail anymore. I actually had one cool job at a sporting goods store that only lasted about two months And then I ended up like moving away to go to college. And then when I moved back home that summer, the sporting goods store was out of business. But that was fun because nobody liked hockey equipment. Like nobody wanted to deal with it. And they were so happy because I knew how to fit hockey skates and I knew hockey. I'd played a little bit of hockey as a kid. I wasn't any good at it, but I knew how to fit skates, fit helmets, stuff like that. So I was just so happy that they would just leave me alone like towards the back of the store and, you know, I'd organize everything, the football stuff, the baseball stuff, whatever, but I'd really noodle around with the hockey equipment and organize all the sticks. I mean, that was my, oh, I had a fourth or fifth retail job, but yeah, my first one was in a card and comic shop. So that was the bomb. It's cool. So evolution and 2122 SP authentic hockey. 
just came out. And also, I saw you put this on Twitter, and I thought it was hilarious that you found this out, that Grandeur Hockey Coins are finally sold out. Yeah. Everybody give yourself a round of applause. I knew we could do it. What will we make fun of now that Grandeur is sold out and you can't actually buy them or get them at 50% off? I mean, like, dude, you knew one thing was true. If it was New Year's Day, if it was Valentine's Day, if it was St. Patrick's Day, if it was President's Day, if it was Easter Sunday, if it was Memorial Day, if it was high school graduation day, if it was Sweetest Day, whatever. Any day Halloween, ending in Y. Grandeur coins would be on sale for 50% off, right? Just anything, you know, just like it's National Donut Day. And to celebrate, Grandeur coins will be 50% off. Head over to EPAC now. Well, and... You know, I posted that in jest, you know, we make fun of the things that we really, truly, deeply, down, darkly love. And, you know, I had a couple comments on there about, you know, people actually like these. Some people like them. You know, they had some decent parallels in them. And for player collectors, it was an interesting piece to get. You know, if you could get the coin of whatever player, maybe you PC. You know, look, we've talked about this numerous times. Was it an overlooked Collectible, yes, absolutely. Hence why it took six years to sell out of these things. Because it's way too niche of a collection. You know, it crosses over between the coin people and the card people and the hockey people. And it's like the hockey people didn't want them. The card people didn't want them. The coin people didn't want them. You know, so other than a few player collectors that were looking for individual pieces, and plus you could buy them secondary, find your player. I don't think anybody wanted to pay... 100 bucks for a novelty coin with a player's face on it. And Queen Elizabeth II's face on the other yeah. side. These were legal tender in like some country, weren't the they? The Cook Islands. Cook Islands, that's I, I know this because I still have my Sean Monaghan coin sitting on my desk. What's the denomination on that? Like how much uh, is that worth like there? $2, I think. Let's see yeah. here. Elizabeth II, Cook Islands. I'm oh, sorry, $5, 2017. So, so it cost you $100. And it will get you five dollars in the Cook Islands, right? Well, one, I don't... I'm not sure what the inflation rate is, but I'm going to guess that it that, that ain't that. Well, I, I don't know where to find the Cook Islands on a map. You don't know where to find the Cook Islands. I mean, on I, a map? I guess I could look on Google Maps, Wikipedia. I mean, Cook Islands, just I'm not going to tell you exactly where, but it's in the South Pacific, like around New Zealand. Oh, fantastic! So they're like a bunch of whole bunch of islands. There's like 10, 15 different islands. So as it was explained to me when I did interview with Upper Deck's president about this set of coins, I'm changing the subject now to coins, even though these coins we always make fun of, but and they're sold out, but they're and they're so from six years ago. But he was telling me that if they're not legal tender somewhere, the coin collectors don't want them. So they were really thinking about the coin collectors when they made this. And I mean, I guess the thing is, is like, do you remember the uh, Pinnacle Mint coins? Absolutely. Me and uh, Jim did a did an episode about that. In fact, it was funny because back when you could still get junk wax relatively cheap, just one day he sent me a box. He bought me a box from like I don't know, maybe it was DA Car World or something. It was something. It was cheap. It was like twenty bucks or whatever. He sends me a box, and then I'm like, "Hey, you sent me something." He's like, "Yeah, we got to do a podcast about this." I'm like, "All right," because you know it's a set that he liked. But that was the thing is that. They were coins, but they weren't like legal tender. So they were affordable. I like oddball stuff like that. I think coins are a little tricky because people hate cards when they're just a quarter of an inch bigger in either direction. They freak out, right? Uh, it's Bowman sized, uh, right? And they, they get all mad. Eight pocket pages. It's like, yes, eight pocket pages are a thing, right? And so I kind of roll with the punches with the oddball stuff. I like that. And but there's like, a place for it. That's why I said it was very a very niche thing. And I think player collectors or team collectors would be way more into it than somebody looking for that quote unquote investment piece because you're not going to find it. Yeah. Like we're talking about a Venn diagram. You mentioned coin collectors, hockey card collectors and hockey fans. Right. And so we're looking for hockey fans who are also coin collectors. And I think those two circles would like barely overlap. I might be wrong about this. You'd get the spirograph design where the circles barely touch. The only hockey fan I can think of off the top of my head who is also into coin collecting was Bruce McNall, who owned the L.A. Kings. 
He I made did, his I millions know, in coins. Yeah, I did know that, and I forgot about that. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing. Like, McNall was into ancient coins. Yeah, I was going to say, it wasn't like normal Buffalo nickels and stuff like that. No, like Greek and Roman Empire stuff. Right. Like the stuff they're digging on Oak Island for. Coin collecting was hot, I guess, in the 70s and 80s. And that's how he made his millions and became rich enough to buy the L.A. Kings. And a trim Thomas Wagner car. Oh, yeah, and the trimmed Hannes Wagner card, yeah. Very first card PSA ever graded. And it was tripped. (laughs) Okay, so, Grandier, good job. You know what? Slow and steady wins the race. Hey, I just want to talk real quick about Jonathan Taves. I feel obligated to. We weren't able to podcast last week because I was just stupid busy. So I was just like, all right, can't do it last week. And, of course, like, we cut our cut. Not like we're cutting a record. We recorded our previous podcast and like two days later like Taves plays in his last game with the Blackhawks I'm like son of a gun why couldn't he have played it on Sunday and we could have talked about it when we recorded on Monday but you know Johnny T the other Johnny T the original Johnny T not talking about John Tavares here I'm talking about Jonathan Taves the other Uh, one is Johnny Pajamas who's that that's John Tavares. Oh, pajamas. That's what all the Islanders fans call him. Since he bailed on them. Uh-huh. Because of that yeah. picture that they posted when he went to the Leafs of him as a kid with his Leafs pajamas and his Leafs bed sheets and all that. So they called him Johnny Pajamas. So Jonathan Taves played his last game April 13th against the Flyers. And earlier in the week, the Blackhawks announced this is going to be Taves' final game in a Blackhawks uniform, you know, obviously because they weren't going to make it into the playoffs. And (laughs) they were really milking this for all it was worth. They kept pushing this, letting everybody know. I'm surprised they weren't selling commercials like they were Super Bowl ads or something because they were really pushing this, you know, Jonathan Taves' last game as a Blackhawk, right? So April 13th against the Flyers, he had a goal. He had three shots on net. He was a minus one. He almost had the game winner in overtime. Yes, that was the key to that game. It's him almost scoring that game winner. Why do you say that was the key? Because that was like the most exciting part. He did have the goal earlier, but that one was way cooler. And he beat the goalie, too. It just the puck, it slid, and it just slowed down enough. And then one of the flyers was able to sweep it away. But, I mean, he, he did beat the goalie if it just had a little more on it it would have gone in and that would have been funny like Jonathan Taves has scored the game winning goal in his last game as a Blackhawk that would have been beautiful but then that would have like made the Blackhawks less likely to get the first overall pick in the upcoming NHL draft and they still got a point in the standings but yeah, it would have been nice if he had won and scored that that would have been that would have been a sweet ending to his either his career as a Blackhawk or just his career in general. Like all the doubters and the haters, but he goes out scoring two goals, including the game winner in overtime in an otherwise unremarkable game against an unremarkable opponent in an unremarkable season. Yeah. Their chances for that pick dropped when they decided that they were gonna beat a couple teams that they shouldn't have towards the end there so okay so i'm gonna bring up the penguins the mutually assured destruction because the blackhawks are like ha penguins we beat you and now you won't be in the playoffs and the penguins are like oh yeah well you fools by beating us you've just worsened your chance of getting that first overall pick ha 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 well they did try to help them out the game right after that too by getting smoked by columbus too the last few games the penguins had the season they played basically some of the worst teams in the nhl this year and couldn't get it done. They just couldn't. All they had to do was win, and they couldn't get it done, and that was the end of it. So the Ducks ended up with the highest. So it goes like Ducks, Columbus, then Chicago. One, two, three. I think that's how it ended up. The Ducks ended up dead last. I was going to say that I made a comment about the Columbus Blue Jackets on Twitter, and, like, I got... I got, I made a lot of Columbus Blue Jackets fans angry. Oh, it was a point about 
Yeah, I'm sure everybody's really looking forward to Connor Bedard going to the- I said, can we all just agree right now that the Columbus Blue Jackets getting to draft Connor Bedard would be the worst thing to happen in hockey since, like, forever? Yeah, you touched a nerve on that one. All the Columbus fans were like, you son of a... <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny myself because I'm like, come on, take a joke for God's sake. I like this one, this one comment, LOL. Obviously you've never watched a Columbus Blue Jackets game. They have some of the most dedicated fans in the league. And then somebody replied, they also have a cannon. And then somebody said, I disagree. In my opinion, San Jose Sharks would be worse spot than the Columbus Blue Jackets. Uh, And then someone said, I honestly think it's the best place for him. Columbus has a solid fan base and already has some decent players, prospects, in line, a featured line of Johnny Hockey, Connor, and Ken Johnson is nasty. I agree with all of that. That's all mm-hmm. true. All of it's true. They have a great okay. fan base. They do have a cannon. He would be good on a younger team like that, you know, an up and coming team, whatever. Fine. People don't take jokes. That's the all problem. right. Continuing with the mean tweets, and then somebody called me world silliest goose is on the loose. Somebody else said, Blue Jackets are definitely losing out. Hawks screwed up by beating Calgary the other night. Columbus is more deserving than most of those teams. At least they're adding stars and trying to get better. Blah, blah, blah. They also have Viney and Johnny Hockey. Uh, Don't forget the one guy that said something like... Oh, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Oh, okay. (laughs) Let's see. Two words. Rick Nash. I'll be honest. I'm really hoping for Adam Fantil to the Blackhawks. Columbus can get silly for Fantilli. Okay. Oh, somebody said here, I know one podcast I don't ever care to listen to. That's the one I was talking about. Yeah. That was my favorite comment. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't jump into that mix. I was going to. I'm like, man, you guys are all missing the point. Yeah. This was a joke, for God's sake. Chill the hell out. People are so sensitive. It's crazy. I'm not going to listen to your podcast. You don't know anything about hockey. I replied and I, I said, of course, the Blue Jackets three fans also happen to follow me on Twitter. And then somebody said, not to be confused with the three fans of the Puck Junk podcast. Okay, so oh, that I was, missed that. I missed that one. That was a good zing. I, I'm gonna. I mean, I'm gonna read that out loud. That that was a that was a pretty good zing. That was from at Unreal NHL Takes. I'll actually give them props because that was funny. You got to be able to laugh at yourself, right? Look. I know Columbus has a good fan base, a great fan base. I know Carolina has a great fan base. I went to two games, and I had a blast at those games, and everybody had a blast at those games, and everybody was having fun, and everybody was super into it. I guess the thing is is that you got your big market teams, and then you kind of got like your mid-market, small to mid-market teams, and those are the ones I tend to pick on, right? Like, I like to make fun of the Penguins, but I will never make fun of them for like not being a solid hockey town. They are a solid hockey town. We both love to rip on the Flyers or Flyers fans, right? But that's a good spot for hockey. You know what I mean? New York, Rangers, yes. Islanders, eh, sometimes. New Jersey, eh. New Jersey should probably not be a team, but they've won cups. They try hard to build a good team. You know what I mean? You have nonsense like Arizona where they're just phoning it in. So, yeah, I make fun of Columbus. The next NHL marquee player going to Columbus. I think somebody even was like, well, you know, LeBron played in Cleveland. Well, this is a different sport we're talking about here. Yeah, but again, I go back to my original point. It was a joke, people. For real. Seriously. It doesn't matter who drafts him. He's going to be a generational type player, regardless of where he goes to. If he goes to a contender right now, then we get to see him in the playoffs. If he goes to a team that's rebuilding, then it may take a couple of years. Hypothetical question for you. Let's just assume that in 2015, let's just say Connor McDavid went to the New York Rangers. How would okay. that have affected hockey? Uh... McDavid is hotly collectible. Everybody knows who he is. Would that have raised hockey's I mean, profile? You essentially have the last two great not that there aren't great Canadian players, but the last two like mega superstar top of everybody's list, Canadian players, then going to two American teams. I don't know that that would have played well <laughs> in Canada. Cause you had Crosby going to the penguins in 05. And then you have 10 years later, his replacement going to New York. Now would it raise hockey's profile? Absolutely. 
because you know how much Gary likes U.S. teams. Going to an original six team, of course. They're going to take all that tradition and all that backstory and everything else and just choke you out with it. doesn't have to be an original six <sighs> I don't know. team, though. I mean... Yeah, but it makes it makes for a, a way better storyline. I know Colorado's one of the best teams, but let's say, like, Connor Bedard went to a, a team like the Colorado Avalanche. That's crazy talk. But look, everybody in the, dra- in the draft lottery has a chance, right? So even if it's a 0.5% chance, there's still a chance. One of those stupid teams gets their ball pulled by some rare chance, right? No, not everybody has a shot. It's It's for the non-playoff teams. And I understand that, but look at the ones at the bottom of the list that have the very slim to none chance of Yeah, like the Penguins, pulled. but you can only move up three spots. You know, the Penguins have a 1.5% chance. Okay. So just based off of how the balls fall. You know, that would be a case, okay, so let's say somebody gets them and maybe Colorado does some wheeling and dealing and makes a trade to get to that point so that they can pick it. I mean, that'd be a case of most people looking at that going, well, well the rich get richer, right? Right. You know, a team that's stacked already with really good players, superstar type players, caliber players, with like Nathan McKinnon and Landis Gog and Kale McCarr, and now they get this guy. Okay, what I was getting at wasn't like the mix of players that they have. I was talking more about the market. And I know I'm going to probably irk some Canadian listeners with this. I don't think yes, we have if, any. You're good. According to our stats, we get, you know, USA and Canada <laughs> – our top two I'm kidding top two and then i think sweden and then after that i think it's like we have a listener in switzerland or something i don't know anyway obviously there are canadian teams and they're canadian hockey fans but i just feel that when you have the big name players okay like you're phrasing this i want a, i mean i feel okay <laughs> You put a mega superstar in a small market team, I don't care if it's in the USA or Canada, that sucks for hockey. And that's what I was saying when I made my comment about the Columbus Blue Jackets. What if the Hartford Whalers drafted Mario Lemieux? Yeah, right, Um, exactly. They had Ronnie Franchise for a long time. Yeah, I know. And he's not Mario Lemieux, but he's still a Hall of Fame caliber player. Yeah, of but course. I think what really sealed that deal for him is was, when he went to the Penguins. Went to, right, exactly. You know, because but. he was just, you know what, okay, so Ronnie Francis scored 100 points, but everybody scored 100 points back then. Hell, 100 points was on the low end. You know, you had guys scoring 120, 130 points who weren't named Gretzky or Lemieux. I know what you're saying. I follow what you're saying. Good or bad for the sport, I don't know, but I follow the logic of what you're saying because... right. When you take a superstar player, you put them on a team that maybe doesn't have as big of a fan base or maybe doesn't have the following that you'd like them to have or is in a smaller market, plays in a smaller arena, doesn't sell out games all the time. Having that superstar player could elevate that team. People then become fans because they want to watch the team play. You'll get ESPN or TNT latching on. We want to see Connor Bedard play, so we're going to put a lot more Blue Jackets games on. You know, we're going to put them on the schedule because we want to see them on live in prime time on TV. Maybe the other teams in the league sell more tickets on days when that team comes into town. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Um, So there's something to be said for all of that. But I know what you're saying. I mean, I follow the logic of what you're saying. Because generally you don't get the exposure on those teams. And if you take the best player that you have and you bury them on a team that nobody's going to pay attention to, then nobody will pay attention to the new guy. And that's where all the eyeballs need to be to grow the game. Yeah, and I even wonder, again, this is just me hypothetically speaking, the 1980s were a wonderful time for hockey, but it was also kind of like the dark ages for hockey a little bit in the United States. And it probably wouldn't have had much of a difference, but Wayne Gretzky coming to Los Angeles raised hockey's profile I don't even want to say tenfold. It was immeasurable how much him coming to the Kings changed hockey in the U.S. And I wonder, what if he was with the Kings this whole time? Or I know we're talking about Gretzky, we're talking about 40 years ago, but I'm just thinking, like, the way hockey grew from 88 to 98 or whatever till Gretzky retired, we played all those years in the U.S., I'm wondering if that would have happened earlier if he was doing all these amazing things 
but it was for an LA Kings or New York Islanders or Chicago Blackhawks or a team that was maybe a little more interesting to the U.S. media. And I know the Canadian fans will be like, well, so what? There's Canada and Canada has media and Canada has hockey fans. But if you want to grow your sport, you have to appeal to where there's a lot of people. The United States has 10 times the population. When you have a bigger market, it does more to help that sport grow. Yeah, when you have more people from a market watching, it helps the sport grow. Back to your point of the Gretzky thing. I don't know it would have played out the same way, honestly. I don't know that it would because it's really hard to say because we could say, what are the odds that Gretzky would have been wouldn't have been popular at Edmonton. Well, the odds are zero percent because he was. We already know what happened. You know, all the Stanley Cup years in the early days, you know, essentially a dynasty of a team well built around him. But then he goes to the Kings, which huge market, absolutely huge market. But when you think in the grand scheme of things from a from a team standpoint, I hardly would have called the Kings like a juggernaut of a watchable NHL market at Mm -hmm. that point. Not until Gretzky got there did it become as big of a thing as it as it was. I mean, sure, they had great players through the years, but you know, nothing like that. No, and I mean I guess the other thing too is when Gretzky came to the Kings, he had already established his legacy. And he was setting the records Oh sure. Yeah. When he was young and then he was breaking other records when he was older. Yeah. I mean, the old adage everybody says, anybody can get traded because Gretzky got traded. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. But you look at the overall marketability of the teams across the board, and it's like, does anybody want to go play for the Ducks? You know, they got a lot of traction a couple years ago and started to get a little more popularity because of some of the younger players on the team. But when's the last time you heard anybody talk about Trevor Zegers? He had an off year. He didn't live up to expectations this past year, so nobody was paying attention to them. Their Mm -hmm. average attendance since the lockout was one of the lowest in the league. So can you call Anaheim the worst uh, hockey market in the league? I don't know. They're going to get the first pick in the draft probably. So we may have, we may have that scenario, you know, in Phoenix or Arizona. I mean, I don't know why I always call them Phoenix. Because we call it Phoenix because it was Phoenix forever. Barely anybody would go to those games to the point where there were so many problems. They're playing in an arena that holds 5,000 fans. So it's just one of those things. You know, look at Florida all the time. Florida Florida can have a contender. Florida can have a team that makes the playoffs every year. They can have a team that goes far in the playoffs every year. People still don't go to the games down there. Tampa's always packed. But for some reason, the Panthers can't fill the stadium. So, I don't know. Putting a player like that, putting a generational player on teams like that, is that going to put butts in seats? Absolutely. What it'll do for the league, I don't know. There could be a trickle-down effect. I guess we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, if you disagree with this and want to voice any complaints, you can do that on Twitter at the Real DFG. That's assuming anybody's still listening. I'm sure they already shut this off. So Yeah, they, they went and put on spitting chicklets. That's much more entertaining than us. Yeah. This and that going, yeah, dude, yeah, dude, yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> And I love Bissonette. You know, I tried listening to Spit and Chicklets, and my head hurt after about 10 minutes. And like you said, you got to skip to the player interviews, and you're right. You're absolutely right about that. The last one I listened to, this was maybe a month or so ago. This was back in, like, March. Uh, They had Tage Thompson on the show, and it was a fantastic interview. It was a fantastic conversation. It wasn't even like where they got all bro doggy about stuff. I mean, he talked about his career, and he talked about his growth as a hockey player, and about getting traded and everything and, and and how he felt when he was traded and and the coaches that believed in him. And I'm like, man, I know so much about Tage Thompson in this half an hour and I really like him now. You know what I mean? Like now I'm like, yeah, I love this guy. He's great. I'm going to root for him. Right. So that's yeah. that's definitely the the draw to that show, if, if you ask me. Not like that anybody a, cares what my opinion is of the most popular hockey podcast. Like him or hate him. I mean you have to give them the fact that they have a culture that players can relate to and are much more willing to open up on a more personal level. It seems on their show 
than almost anybody else. Mm-hmm. I mean, Cam and Strick are pretty good too. I mean, if you're looking for a good hockey podcast to listen to, they get a lot of good interviews as well. Guys that are very candid about things and talk about that one's a little less pushing pink Whitney and dude wipes. Oh my God. So if you want a decent one to listen to, that's another, another one you can pick up on. Wow. Yeah. The pink Whitney commercials are a little much. Yeah. Anyway. So, um, Let's talk about SP Signature Edition Legends Hockey. Now, what I thought was funny, I'll just say this really quick, is that on the box, it just says SP Signature Edition Legends Hockey. But actually, when I opened a box and I looked at the back of the cards to sort them, at the bottom, it says 2021 SP Signature Edition Legends. So this is actually a set that was intended to come out in 2021. Did not come out until 2023. And I like the way they dropped the year off of the packaging. But they didn't drop the year off the back of the cards, probably because these were designed and probably in the process of getting printed. And that's then exactly, that's exactly what happened. But then by the time they did the pack out, they said, eh, let's not put a year on this because we really don't have to, because these aren't players. From 2223. These are players from the past, hence the name Signature Edition Legends. So I think that's kind of funny. Kind of like good recovery, like almost enough of a recovery. Like people won't think they're buying an old product. They won't really care. And you'll talk about some of the outrageous eBay prices. Let me just give the listeners here a rundown about SP. Signature Edition Legends Hockey. Uh, The box says, look for hard-signed autographs from Legends of the Game. I don't know why they don't just say on-card autos. Hard-signed. What's the opposite of hard-signed? Is that soft-signed? Soft-signed. Do people call it that, though? No, they call it sticker autos. So they could just say, look for two autographs per box, or they could say, look for two on-card autographs per box. I don't know who came up with the term hard signed but i don't like it that's like one of those hobby terms i don't like we should just get rid of it duly noted i'll send it up the chain do that make it so get five cards per pack 18 packs per box boxes are selling for about 200 bucks a box now i think at launch they were closer to what about 220 230 box yeah i think i saw some 240s early on but okay yeah So the set breakdown, there are 300 base cards, which is pretty freaking huge, and 50 short prints. So this is 350 legends, but not all legends are created equal. You know, you'll get Gordie Howe, but then you'll also get Dave Lumley. That's fine. No disrespect to Mr. Lumley, but I'll just grab a random stack here. Dave Andrichuk, Greg Gilbert, love Greg Gilbert. Jack Valiquette, Daniel Merwa, Dan Bouchard, Darren Langdon. Murray Wilson, Reggie Leach, Paul Bissonette, speak of the Pink Whitney, Brian Prop, Danny Heatley, Guy Schweinard, David Shaw, David Lumley, Dan McGillis, Willie O'Ree, Sammy Salo, Terry Raskowski, Nick Schultz, J.S. Jaguar, Dave Barr, Bob Nevin, Brooks Orpik, Ray Bork, Phil Esposito, Pat LaFontaine, Mike Madano, Nicholas Lindstrom. That's just a pinch of cards that I grabbed. So that gives you an idea of like, the range and the breadth of players that are in the set. You got about 10 Hall of Famers in that pile, about another six or seven guys that people would recognize, and then a whole bunch of players that were legends for their specific teams that they played for, but people outside of that fan base may not be familiar with them. Right. Greg Gilbert, he's notable because he played with the Islanders during their cup years. And then he also played with the Rangers and won a cup with them, too. So he he won with the Islanders and he won with the Rangers. Of course, there's a lot of players who won with more than one team, especially that Rangers team that had like a lot of ex-Oilers on it. But yeah, so you get your five cards per pack. Some of the in, in an average box break, you'll get two autographs per box. You'll get four 
UD Canvas Legends, so the Canvas set, but it's all Legends players, as is the set. Three Dominant Digits cards, which have, like, the player and, like, their number really big on it. You get three other inserts, either Evolve, Life After Hockey, or Behind the Boards. Three Gold Base Parallels, one Profiles Bounty card, and one Rare Hit card. So I pretty much got all that in my box, although as far as the three... Like this, this, or this, I got two Evolve inserts and one Behind the Boards insert. So I didn't get a um, Life After Hockey insert. Who was your Behind the Board? Terry O'Reilly. I like the concept of that because very rarely do you get coaches sets. Yeah. Then the last card in my box was a Decagon's Shiny Die Cut card. So it's shiny, it's die cut, and it's one per box. Well, they, they say one rare hit card. And the one that I got was this Decagons card, which is kind of nice. Nice looking card. Got one of Rocket Richard. So anyway. It's always good uh, when you get a card of a guy that has a trophy named after him. Oh, well, yeah. So looking at this set, I'll say that I like the design. I like the design, and it appears, from what I could tell, that they have all the stats on the back. I'm looking at Al McInnes' card right here. It says 23 seasons, 84. No, maybe it doesn't have everything. Because it lists 84.85 to 03.04. So maybe they just do 20 years. Okay, so that's a bit of a miss that you don't have all the stats. Come on, just do it. Just get all the stats on there. Just figure it out. If you got to do a Gordy Howe card, just get rid of the headshot on the back. Do all the stats. They couldn't fit four more lines on there? Well, I mean, maybe for McKinnis, but, you know... Gordie Howe is the outlier. What do you do about a guy who played, you know, 26 NHL seasons? Well, since they refuse to acknowledge any of the WHA, she'd be able to fit most of it in there. Yeah, actually, now I'm wondering. I'm going to look if my Terry Raskowski. Yeah, they don't list any of his WHA. They just list his NHL stats. Boo. Okay, so, of course, I'm going to complain about not having all the stats on the back. Because you know what? If Tops could figure out a way to do it back in the 80s and the 90s, Upper Deck should be able to figure out how to do it in the 2020s, right? Just have less stuff. Make the design a little different. Accommodate the statistics. Make the font smaller. Figure it out. We're rare people. Yeah, I know, but those still. Are the, those are the things that we complain about. Well, okay, but <laughs> no, everybody else complains that they can't get the right ROI out of their box. But who's buying these cards? Okay. It, ah, okay. See, that brings up the great point. Yeah. Okay. But let me give you my counterpoint, which you're going to prove wrong. I know this is wrong, but I'm just going to say it anyways. This set is meant to appeal to the long time old school collectors like us or the people who love hockey history, because as we mentioned on a prior podcast, when we talked about the Hall of Fame sets, and I talk about how much I love that Cardophilium Hockey Hall of Fame set from 1983, all those guys were retired. It was a Hall of Fame set, and half right. of them were probably dead by that point, especially the guys that played in Plus, like 1910 yeah. or whatever. But I loved that set. I love hockey history. So for me, it was a way to learn about the sport. So like me at 15, I would have loved this set. And me at 48, I love this set right now, too, because, you know, it's a throwback set of old school players. You know, like you said, Hall of Famers, legends, and fan favorites. So, okay. So I think guys like me and Tim would be buying up this set and loving it and saying, oh, yeah, I love all these cards of guys that played 30 years ago or even 10 years ago, blah, blah, blah. However... Well, and I agree with you on both of those terms. Right. Because I think we've talked, you know, we talked about this set coming out years ago when they announced it, and then it never came out, and we brought it up a few times here and there in between. And when they did release it, we talked a little bit about it before any of us had it. But, you know, it's a long-term collector set rather than a quote-unquote card investor type set. Not to say that there isn't stuff in there that's, worth the money because there is there's plenty of stuff in there that's big time but let's look at how this rolled right this came out march 8th lots of fanfare every breaker imaginable had this and they were busting boxes and after all the break breakers pretty much got to the point where they decided that 
they either couldn't pronounce the names of the players or they never heard of some of these defunct teams and didn't know how to handle them in team breaks because they didn't have those teams listed on their team breaks because when they went to the NHL website, those teams weren't listed there and they don't know who any of these people are if they're not named Gretzky. Well, guess what happens? Now the large chunk of who's buying stuff in quantities disappears. So by a month, probably a month later, no one was really talking about this set anymore. And it hasn't been out that long. We're simply, we're talking about stuff that's happened in the last two months. I haven't heard a peep about this after the fact. But not only that, right after it was released and everybody started breaking them, none of the retailers had them in stock. So they had to wait till inventory rolled in again. So it was hard to get them. So like right now, 210, 225, between that range, that's what you're finding the boxes for. What's killing me is, and I think this is what you were bringing up, what I was going to say is, from a collector standpoint and from somebody that's looking to pick up certain things from this set, it's definitely carrying weight on the secondary market. And you can clearly see that if you go to the auctions. I mean, you know, I hate to always bring up eBay, but... I can't win a stinking auction for any cards from this set to save my life. I get outbid every single time I bid on anything. And we're talking stuff that you think no one would want for prices you think no one would be willing to pay for. I mean, it's it's crazy. I feel like I'm over overbidding on stuff, and then I get outbid. And it's absolutely nuts. Tell them what cards you're talking about specifically. Well, I'm trying to pull the Penguin cards. I'm trying to get all of the Penguin cards that are in the set and all of their, you know, variants and all that kind of stuff. But I was also interested in these Future Watch cards. Mm -hmm. And I've been watching them. And I'll tell you what, the Future Watch autos, ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. The prices on these Future Watch autos. Because something you have to take into consideration, right? For all of those out there that are like, oh, future watch autos, those are good. These aren't really rookie cards. You can't consider this a rookie card when it came out 30 years after a guy retired. Right. These aren't rookie cards, right? These are like throwback-esque retro type cards. And yeah, they do have autographs on them. And yeah, a lot of them are Hall of Famer autographs. But if you try to find Hall of Famer autographs of some of these same players in other products, they're way less money. And I know some of these are serial numbered. Most of them are either numbered out of 49 or 99 or 149 or whatever, or 199. I mean, you know, whatever the numbers are. But seriously, listen to some of these prices, right? If I just go back and look at some of these auctions that have the most bids that have closed in the last, let's say, say 90 days. Mm -hmm. The product, product hasn't been out that long, but let's just go backward. The Joe Sackick. Future Watch Auto is numbered out 49. 43 bids sold 1225. Wait. That's not the time of day it sold. That's how much it sold for. $1,225. For a Joe Sackick. A Joe Sackick. Autograph. And it's serial numbered out of what? 49. Okay. Okay. So it's Hold it's one on of the now listen it's one of the all time future watch so it's okay. the F, the quote unquote FWA future watch auto, but sold for twelve twenty five. Uh, Crazy right? Crazy. Yes, because okay, Hall of Fame player, legendary yes. player, yes. huge fa- huge fan base with yes. Colorado. Yes. This particular card pictures him as a Nordique in his yeah. rookie uniform. You know, rookie year. That's the photo that's on the card. You know, he signed it. Granite. Has Joe Sackett signed a lot of things? Yes. Does he sign a lot anymore? I'm not sure. I heard he doesn't, but that could be wrong. But hey, whatever. 1225. Here, here's another example, just throw out there. Another one out of 49. Timu Solani, right? Timu's went for 600. 40 bids on that auction. $600. Can you get a Timu autograph for less than 600? Absolutely. But Future Watch Auto. Even Saku Koivu, 85 bucks. Would you think that'd be that much? 85 for a Saku auto? Great player. Uh, he was the captain of the Canadians. Sure, great player. But it's a numbered out of 199. It's not the lower tier. So there's 200 of them sold for 85 bucks. 
Ray Bork, numbered out of 99. $275. Okay, now that seems kind of oh, but it's only numbered out of, you said 299? 99. 99. But okay. Ray Bork is 99. But $275. Bucks. Can you get a Bork auto less than that? Yeah, absolutely. You get a Bork auto from like $50 to $75. You know, the Peter Forsberg out of 99 sold for $1,040. But these are all the SP Future Watch cards. Yes, I'm strictly talking about the Future Watch autos. Right, Other so, autos of the same players on different cards from the same set are selling for much less. Well, I mean, to give a parallel, and this is not nowhere the same dollar value, but when we had the lockout season in 2004, 2005, they did young guns of guys like Jeremy Roenick and Mike Madano and Steve Eiserman. And yes. they also did like Gary Thorne and Hobie Baker yes. and Dennis Broder, Cami Granado. So like hockey legends who weren't necessarily NHL players, but then they also did young guns of NHL players. And some of those go for like 40, 50 bucks. And you go, okay, how can a young gun of Mike Madano, a card that's, more than 10 years past his rookie card and not really his rookie card sell for so much, right? And it's because people who collect young guns will say, oh, cool, this is a young gun of a Hall of Famer, you know? And so I think the same thing here. Like, I mean, you could go to a fall or spring expo sooner or later and you'll see Dominic Hasek there again, and you can get an autograph on anything you want for less than what that SP Authentic card is. So it's obviously that it's a future watch auto. That's really what's making people lose their minds about these cards. And I guess that's okay, but also it seems a little crazy, but I guess when you lose your mind, you're crazy. So yeah, there you go. Well, I'll just run down a, a few of these. Please. Just, just to give you an idea. Henrik Sedin, out of 99, 162 bucks. Mm, right? Okay, I could see that. Brett Hall, 275. See that. Jerome McGinley, $230. 26 bids on that auction. I see plenty of Jerome Ginla autographs that are out there that sell for 20 bucks. I mean, I got one at the uh, Fall Expo for 20 bucks. Yeah. I don't know so. if it was numbered, but it was a Jerome Ginla autograph. And I said, awesome, Hall of Fame player, 20 bucks. I'll buy it, you know. The Mike Bossy, who has since passed away, who can't sign anymore, 395. And that one was numbered out of 10. But like Wendell Clark, 117 bucks. Frequently still signs. Owen Nolan, 60 bucks. Owen Nolan, $60. I know. Oh, I saw one of his Be A Player autos from like 98 for like $2. <laughs> I could not sell a Mike Bossy autograph card. It was a manufactured letter card. It was signed on the letter. And I want to say it was numbered out of 25. And I couldn't sell this dang thing at the National and I couldn't even sell it at a couple of the most recent conventions. I probably had this card probably since 2021, and I brought it with me to every show, and I couldn't sell it. I finally ended up selling it to another dealer because he really wanted it, and I was just like, all right, I'll just, you know, it's fine. But, yeah, crazy. Well, that's interesting because there was another one that sold a little while later for 419 So, basically, 400 is the wheelhouse for that card. For two, the, two sales, two sales. Yeah. The, but it, again, it's numbered out of 10, so it's obviously a lower print run. Even newly fired Ron Hextall that has no job and should be homeless. 82 bucks. There were 19 bids on that for a number card out of 199. You know, Bobby Clark, $201. There were 20 bids on that. That's numbered out of 99. So, I mean, you can see these are really high comparatively. Even the Brad Richards card. Brad Richards autograph, $37. Like, are you crazy? 37 bucks. So, you know, even the, the lesser guys are getting. Now, I'm sure all of you are waiting with bated breath that don't already know this and wondering, well, has one of the Gretzky sold? Yes, it has. Care to venture to guess what the Gretzky Future Watch Auto sold for? All right, let me ask, what is it numbered out of? Could you at least tell me that much? 49. So it's not the lowest, but it's certainly not the highest. I mean, if Sackick sells for twelve twenty-five, mm -hmm. and that was numbered out of twenty-five, I believe. No, nope, forty-nine also. Okay, so forty-nine and forty-nine. Yes. I mean, I'm gonna say Gretzky is gonna go for double that, but maybe not exactly double. So I'll say, 
uh, see, I want to say eighteen hundred dollars, but that seems rational. So I'm going to say twenty two seventy five. And based on how we were going here, I would say that would be a good bet. But with twenty eight bids, this thing sold for three thousand eight hundred and eighteen dollars. Ooh. Yeah. So. Look, are any of these obtainable? I don't know. It depends on what your budget is. But I'm certainly not in on anything that I've named from that list. You know, when the cheapest one so far, I think that I even said was Brad Richards at 37 bucks. Like, I'm certainly not going to pay, no offense to Brad Richards, but I'm certainly not going to pay 37 bucks for a Brad Richards autograph just because it's a feature watch auto. So I got two autographs in my box, as you're supposed to get. And these were not future watch autos. Neither of them were, which is depressing. I didn't care who it was. I just wanted to get one of those. I yeah. Mean, I mean, Brad Richards would have got you at least 37 bucks. Well, I mean, my dream card, if anybody's listening and they want to gift me a card, not that they're going to give me this one, but my dream card would be the future watch rookies auto of Dominic Hasek in a Blackhawks jersey. And he's got the 75th anniversary patch on his chest. So it's from the 91-92 season. And I would you're love... You're going to say Ronick, right? Uh, I said Hasek. Oh, but I'm saying you're going to say Ronick also, right? Well, yeah, sure. Of course, Ronick. Ronick's one mm. of my favorite. I mean, you know, Ronick and Chelios, Chelios and Ronick. I mean, those are my top two right there. Hard to pick one. It's like, who do you like better, Han Solo or Luke Skywalker, right? You like qualities of one and you like qualities of the other, but you like them both and you don't want to have to pick one. Here, I'll help you out. Ronick sold for, well, one sold for $140. Another one sold for $120. All right. And if you'd like the lesser Ronick and go with the Steve Larmer card, $73. Wow. Yeah. So... I mean, and that's the thing that, like, that boggles my mind is, you know, a couple months ago, I got Steve Larmer's autograph for, like, 20 bucks. Yep. I mean, and I get that you're getting a specific, unique card that you can't get anywhere else. It's limited edition, this and that, and it's an SP Future Watch Auto. But anyways, the two autographs that I got, I got a Brian Mullen Century Legends signature. Yeah, it looks nice. I mean, it's horizontal. There's a lot of room for an autograph, and that looks cool. And then the other card I got was Brian Campbell. This kind of looks like an upper deck design from a previous season, but I can't quite put my finger on it. But it's got like the little headshot in the corner. Is that him on the Sabres? That's him on the Sabres in the White Buffalo. Interesting. Yeah. So both my autographs were of guys named Brian. Brian Mullen, Brian Campbell. Okay. I like Brian Campbell. I like Brian Mullen. Brian Mullen was a good player. Brian Campbell was arguably, if you look at those Blackhawk Cup years, he was arguably the league's best number three defenseman in the league. I kind of say that in jest because he was probably the highest paid player on the team until Kane and Taves signed their long-term deals. But the top two D-men on the Blackhawks were Duncan Keith and Brent Seabrook. So we had this like guy making like $9 million a year and he was like, on the second defensive pairing. But that doesn't mean he wasn't awesome and he's a fast as hell skater. But yeah, I mean, okay. I'm like, yay, Brian Campbell. I like that. Brian Mullen. Okay, it's a nice card. I can't always expect to get the best autograph in a box. I mean, that almost never happens. That's kind of like a once in a blue moon type of thing. For me, it was like I got a Bobby Orr autograph in a box maybe 10 years ago. So it does happen. You buy enough cards, eventually you're going to hit something big. But I guess I was like a little like, ah. On the Mullen card, does it show him as a Ranger? No, I think he's a Jet. Yeah, he's got a Jets logo on his helmet. Interesting. I have his 06 Parkhurst autograph. Yeah, you know. um, But he's on a Rangers uniform there. Focusing on just this set as a whole, not necessarily the overpriced SP Future Watch autos. I think it's a nice looking set. I like the design on the front. You kind of have these two lines that kind of look like hockey sticks that converge in the center on an SP authentic logo, which I think is pretty cool. It kind of almost looks like mid 2000s MVP design a little bit, doesn't it? Kind of like that shield shape. Yeah, like 06. 
Oh six, yeah. Oh yeah. five or oh six, which are very hard to tell apart. Yeah, they are very hard to tell apart. Oh five and oh six MVP because I've mixed those up frequently when sorting them. But now that I think about it, SP Authentic, that's the set, if I remember correctly, that has the player cut out and like swirly stuff in the background. I mean, yeah, sometimes it's usually just mostly white though. Yeah, maybe some geometric shape or pattern or something. Yeah, there'll be like a design stamped into the background somehow. Yeah, and this looks more like an MVP design now that I think about it. Back like mid-2000s MVP, where you still see some of the background behind the player, although it's black and white, the background. And then the player has like this spot varnish on them, which is like SP Authentic, where the background is kind of dull, but the player is like extra glossy. So it kind of pops a little. You know, and it's you got your shiny foil. And then with the gold parallels, they have like facsimile autograph on it. And then, like I said, you get the different inserts, like the one um, Evolve shows like the player. I like those Evolve inserts. I think they're cool. Yeah, I mean, I got one of Joe Sackick and it's kind of cool. Shows him as a Nordique and shows him as an Avalanche, you know, so I guess different parts of their career. And then the other Evolve card that I got, which I thought was kind of cool was of Mike Liute. And what I like about it is that it's the word evolve. And then like the letters have cut out photos in them. So like the EV has Mike Liute as a blue. And then the OL has Mike Liute as a whaler. And then the VE has Mike Liute as a Washington Capitals. You know, so it's kind of cool when you could split it up into like three teams like that three different points of their career. So I think that's pretty neat. Yeah, my last one that I lost out on was a Evolve Randy Carlisle card. Oh, okay. Because it, it shows him as a Leaf and as a Penguin and as a Jet. Makes sense. So that's the last one that I can think of that I bid on that I ended up losing at the end. <laughs> I actually bid three bucks for it, and I still didn't get it. For a Randy Carlisle card. <laughs> How much did you bid? I bid three bucks and I still lost. So bid four. It was too late. I lost. I get it. Well, somebody else likes Randy Carlisle. There's a couple more out there that, that I'm going to go. I'm going to try to get all the penguins out of the set. Uh huh. Because feasibly right now with buying boxes and stuff like that, and considering how they're, at least around me, hard to find, it won't be feasible to build a set. So I will be happy with my team, especially considering it's a very interesting mix of players. Maybe some breakers selling a complete base set because I want this set, but I don't want to have to put it together because 300 cards, not counting the 50 short prints, that's a lot of work. You know, and I only got 66 yeah. base cards in my box. So I'd have to buy like five boxes to build a base set. Sure. I don't know if I want to spend $1,000 on building a base set. That's a lot. That would also get me 10 autographs. And maybe I'd get the Gretzky numbered out of 49 or whatever, but probably not. And I'm not going after the bounty program. Some of the cards, the special bounty cards have like a scratch off code on the back. And I guess you collect all of these profiles inserts and then they give you codes and do some sort of bounty thing. And you can get like some special cards, which I should know more about that. But honestly, you got to be a high roller for that. It's just not something I ever look into. The bounty program is always set up where, you know, the first few people that actually are able to complete the set are able to redeem for whatever the prize is. And a lot of times it becomes what it actually says it is. And it's a bounty program because you'll get tons of people that are just looking for the codes so that they can get the redemption sets. And you know, once those things hit the secondary market, the redemption sets tend to pull a higher premium because there's only so many of them. Right. And it took work to get to them. Not quite to the extent of like the top redemption program that we just saw people paying bajillions of dollars for. But who's going to win in that bounty program? And that's going to be people who buy a couple of cases, right? I mean, because they're going to get a lot of cards that way, a lot of bounty cards. Assuming that that's what you're going for, yeah. Well, I guess that's the thing, though, is that, like, to us, if a bounty set was attainable, I mean, I guess it's it's a finite amount of cards, but it's still expensive. I mean, look, people can afford what they can afford, and that's fine. And we all have a threshold of 
what we're willing to pay for something and what we're not willing to pay for something. And we all have to draw the line somewhere because you just can't collect every card. If you it's can't? an insert, what I know, right? I've tried and I gave up. You know, if it's a 10 card insert set, fine. But if it's like 18 or 30 card insert set or whatever, and you only get one per box usually, you know, then you're buying a lot of boxes or you're paying a lot for those codes. And I'm just not that excited about that. I, I just don't have deep enough pockets. And that's okay. Some people do. And that's fine. Since you brought it up, I'm pulling sure. it up right now as we're talking. So of the current bounty. Mm-hmm. So it's the gold spectrum foil numbered parallel set. Plus a shot at the one of one black auto parallels. Mm-hmm. There are none. So they've all been redeemed. Really? Yes. And there were 48 codes. So you had to get 48 of the cards. What were the Pro- insert on those? How many profiles. Oh. Those are on the profiles, and you got how many in a box? I got, it one? says you're supposed to get one, but I got two. Oh, okay. So one or two per box, and you need 48 of them, right? So let's mm-hmm. assume the worst. That's 48 boxes. <laughs> so 48 boxes, at, let's call it 200 bucks a pop. It's a lot. Yeah, it is. Like but I said, give I- up your search because they're gone. Well, that's fine. And that's the other thing, too, is that's got to be frustrating if you say, all right, I'm all in. I'm going to buy three cases of this. And you got to do that, like, right away. And you just got to get to it right away. And then you got to just track down those codes right away. And it's a lot of money. It's a lot of work. And you can't take your time doing this. This can't be like, well, once I get them all, then I can redeem them. Because what good is the bounty card once the bounty has been redeemed, right? These profile cards that I have now have absolutely no real yeah, value because other than what's the, the market collectors. right? And what's the market for a card that's been scratched? You know that has the scratch off thing on the side. Yeah. yeah, it's like saying, okay, here's your artifacts redemption. Is the redemption card worth anything? Maybe if you scratch it off, is it? No. I get like with some of these cards, even if you scratch the code off on the back. It's still a card. It's not just a redemption card. It is a player card with statistics on it and stuff. Like, remember back in 2019, that upper deck, was it the singles day promotion? And you had the cards that had the codes on the back. And even though those were all redeemed, you know, people still want the cards, even if they're scratched, because it's the player on the front that they're concerned about. They need it for their player collection or whatever, you know? Sure. There's somebody for the card. You just have to find them sometimes. Yeah. So more on the bounty thing, not to be a dead horse. No, no, it's but, okay. I mean, we brought up SP coming out. You know, SP Authentic being a newer release, like just recently. So the bounty chase in that, there's 40 left. And that just came out a couple of days ago. Yep. 40 left. I don't know yeah. if it started at 40, but there's currently 40 left. <laughs> But that takes 99 of them. So you have to get 99 of those Spectrum FX. <sighs> you get a 100-card set out of the deal. But still, it's a lot. All right, so any last thoughts about the set before we wrap it up? No, I mean, I still like the set. I don't know how, how much access I'm going to have to it in the short term. Maybe in the long term. It's still a great set. I have nothing really bad to say about it, honestly. All my bad things I had to say about it, I said already, and most of those had to do with the fact that all these people were opening boxes and cases that had no business opening boxes and cases. Well, I think it's funny. I mean, I guess here's the thing. Like, if you pull an autograph of an Atlanta Flame, you go, okay, well, that goes to whoever picked Calgary, right? Logically, I guess. If you're going to follow the team lineage, sure. Okay, and then, like, Colorado Rockies... Do those go to people who paid for Colorado Avalanche or who paid for New Jersey Devils? Again, if you're following the lineage, you'd have to go to the Devils, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. And then That's... what do you do about if you pull the odd Oakland Seal card? I mean, that just goes in the trash. Yeah, exactly. The Jills Malosh autograph card, if there is one. No, I'd keep that one. Or if there was Craig Patrick as a Seal, I'd keep that one. Actually, the... 
Panini classic signatures. That's all Craig Patrick is listed with the seals. I have that autograph. Yeah, but I guess what I'm saying is like you're a breaker bro and you're like, okay, I pulled this California Golden Seal or Oakland Seal card. And it's just, yeah, follow the lineage on that. Like, okay, well, the Seals became the Barons. The Barons merged with the North Stars. But then the North Stars kind of got split into the Sharks and the North Stars because there was that dispersal draft where the Sharks took a bunch of North Stars players because you basically had two franchises became one franchise and then that one franchise became two franchises again 12, 14 years later. So I'm just saying, like, what do you do if you pull a Pittsburgh Pirate or a Philadelphia Quaker? Not, not that they're in this set, you know, or St. Louis Eagles, right? Again, not that they're in this set, but that's just kind of a funny thing, you know what I mean? Like, I think there's at least one player depicted. I know there's a couple as Atlanta Flames. I think Flanny McDonald is one of them. But I almost want to say there's at least one Kansas City Scouts card in that set. Mm -hmm. I think there is. If you look at the Scouts, the Scouts became the Colorado Rockies, who then became the Devils. So if you're going to follow that franchise, (laughs) you got a couple places you got to go first. Yeah, well. So it makes it difficult for sets like that. And, you know, if you're going to do this as a breaker, I mean, I hate to say it. I know breakers aren't about necessarily doing their homework and everything on products like that and especially hockey because there's only a few breakers out there that really focus and do do well with hockey product i think all these other ones that are like oh look new release we got a five case allocation great now we're gonna break a bunch of product and pronounce everybody's name wrong that was all my the only thing negative that i had to say about the product when it came out was just that it's it's not a product that's designed for everybody and i think a lot of the wrong collecting demographic was hitting it hard Mm -hmm. so sucked up the supply pretty quick yeah kind of a miss misallocation there like it went to the wrong people who didn't appreciate it and uh yeah now it's kind of feel like it kind of feel like that kind of calming down a bit and becoming a little more attainable it's in stock price is a little lower but like i said kind of a tough set to build and I guess if you're chasing the other stuff, then the base set is kind of secondary. But I might try to scoop up a base set online and not build it pack by pack. Yeah, I'll be interested to see what a full set would go for if somebody built yeah. one. I'm sure there's a there's some case breakers out there that had to have. Nah, they just throw that stuff out. They don't want to mess with the base cards. That's pennies on the dollars, my friend. Pennies on the dollar. I don't know. I bet you'd be hard-pressed to find a full set if somebody had one for less than a couple hundred bucks. Hmm. Good luck. All right, I think we're going to wrap it up. So thank you for listening to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. As always, if you've enjoyed the show, please be sure to like and subscribe. Please be sure to tell your friends. Please try and write us a review on Apple iTunes. And until next time, collect what you like. For more hockey goodness, follow us on Twitter at PuckJunk.